experience do you get when you hear that something really good came out of something really bad? Like, have you guys ever heard the saying that most of the regs are written in blood? Or worse yet, that it takes people dying to ever get anything changed? Well, I'll tell you what, I'm all for minimal regulation. But the flip side of a lack of regs is that sometimes stupid human tricks are allowed to ruin things for everyone. And then you get rules, all right. Lots of rules. I'm sure most parents can relate. But sometimes you get more than a rule, though. Sometimes when a tragedy happens, an entire establishment or system can be overturned. Or you get really lucky, and something grows out of it that's so great that everything coming after it will be changed for the better. Now, I'm not saying that that makes any disaster excusable, but hey, we're in the business of flying here. So we all know that clouds have silver linings. So that's today's show. In three parts, the silver linings that came out of the disaster atop Mount Weather, Virginia, on December 1st, 1974. I'm Brandon Gonzalez. This is Podcasting on a Plane. Thanks for joining in. When TWA lost Flight 514, the industry was changed forever. Not immediately, of course, but three very important things we use every single day eventually grew out of the ashes on top of that foothill. Documentaries and books have been written on the topic, and links are in the description, of course. And I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel when it comes to covering this, but today's episode hopefully will serve as a really good overview for you to learn about how one single accident gave us so many of the things that we now take for granted. At 11.10 Eastern Standard Time on December 1st, 1974, TWA Flight 514, a Boeing 727, registered November 54328, crashed 25 miles north-northeast of Dulles International Airport, Washington, D.C. The accident occurred while the flight was descending for a VOR DME approach to runway 12 at Dulles during instrument conditions. The 92 occupants, 85 passengers, and 7 crew members were killed, and the aircraft was destroyed. The NTSB determines that the probable cause of the accident was the crew's decision to descend to 1,800 feet before the aircraft had reached the approach segment where that minimum altitude applied. The crew's decision to descend was a result of inadequacies and lack of clarity in the air traffic control procedures, which led to a misunderstanding on the part of the pilots and the controllers regarding each other's responsibilities during operations in terminal areas under IMC. Nevertheless, the examination of the planned view of the approach should have disclosed to the captain that a minimum altitude of 1,800 feet was not a safe altitude. Contributing factors were 1. The failure of the FAA to take timely action to resolve the confusion and misinterpretation of the air traffic terminology although the agency had been aware of the problem for several years. Number two, the issuance of the approach clearance when the flight was 44 miles from the airport on an unpublished route without clearly defined minimum altitudes. And number three, inadequate depiction of altitude restrictions on the profile view of the approach chart for the VOR DME approach to runway 12 at Dulles. TWA Flight 514 was a regularly scheduled flight from Indianapolis, Indiana to Washington, D.C. with an intermediate stop at Columbus, Ohio. There were 85 passengers and 7 crew members aboard the aircraft when it departed Columbus. The flight was dispatched by TWA's dispatch office in New York through the operations office in Indianapolis. The captain received a dispatch package which included an en route and destination weather information. The flight operated under a computer stored instrument rules flight plan. Flight 514 departed Indianapolis at 8.53 and arrived in Columbus at 9.32. The crew obtained weather and aircraft load information. The flight departed Columbus at 10.24, 11 minutes late. At 10.36, the Cleveland Center informed the crew of Flight 514 that no landings were being made at Washington National because of high crosswinds, and that flights destined for that airport were either being held or diverted to Dulles. At 10.38, the captain of Flight 514 communicated with the dispatcher in New York and advised him of the information he had received. The dispatcher, with the captain's concurrence, subsequently amended Flight 514's release to allow the flight to proceed to Dulles. At 10.42, Cleveland Center cleared Flight 514 to Dulles Airport via the Front Royal VOR, and to maintain flight level 290. At 10.43, the controller cleared the flight to descend to flight level 230 and across a point 40 west of Front Royal at that altitude. Control of the flight was then transferred to Washington Center, and communications were established with that facility at 10.48. During the period between receipt of the amended flight release and the transfer of control to Washington Center, the flight crew discussed the instrument approach to 1-2, the nav aids, and the runways at Dulles, and the captain turned the flight controls over to the first officer. When radio communications were established with Washington Center, the controller affirmed that he knew the flight was proceeding to Dulles. Following this contact, the cockpit voice recorder indicated that the crew discussed various routings they might receive to conduct a VOR DME approach to 1-2 at Dulles. They considered the possibilities of proceeding via Front Royal VOR, via Martinsburg, or proceeding on a straight-in clearance. At 10.51, the Washington Center controller requested the flight's heading. 
After being told that the flight was on a heading of 100, the controller cleared the crew to change to a heading of 090 to intercept a 300 radial of the Armel VOR to cross a point 25 miles northwest of Armel to maintain 8,000. He said, the 300 radial will be for a VOR approach to runway 12 at Dulles. He gave the crew an altimeter setting of 2974 for Dulles. The crew acknowledged this clearance. The CVR recording indicated that the Armel VOR was then tuned on a navigational receiver. The pilots again discussed the VOR DME approach to 1 2. At 10.55, the landing preliminary checklist was read by the flight engineer, and other crew members responded to the calls. A reference speed of 127 knots was calculated and set on the airspeed indicator reference points. The altimeters were set at 2974. At 10.57, the crew again discussed items on the instrument approach chart, including the round hill intersection, the final approach fix, the visual approach slope indicator, and runway lights, and of course the airport diagram. At 10.59, the captain commented that the flight was descending from 11,000 to 8,000, and he asked the controller if there were any weather obstructions between the flight and the airport. The controller replied that he did not see any significant weather along the route. The captain replied that the crew also did not see any weather on the aircraft weather radar. The CVR recording indicated that the captain then turned on the anti-icing system. At 11.01, the controller cleared the flight to descend and maintain 7,000 and contact Dulles Approach Control. 26 seconds later, the captain initiated a conversation with Dulles Approach and reported that the aircraft was descending from 10,000 feet to maintain 7,000. He also reported having received information Charlie, transmitted on the ATIS broadcast. The controller replied with a clearance to proceed inbound to Armel and to expect a VR DMA approach to runway 12. The controller then informed the crew that the ATIS information Delta was current and read that data to them. The crew determined that the difference between information Charlie and Delta was the altimeter setting, which was given in Delta as 2970. There was no information on the CVR to indicate that the Pilots reset their altimeters from 2974. At 11.04, the flight reported it was level at 7,000. Five seconds after receiving that report, the controller said, TWA 514, you're cleared for a VOR DME approach to runway 12. This clearance was acknowledged by the captain. The CVR recorded the sound of the landing gear horn, followed by a comment from the captain that 1,800 is the bottom. The first officer then said, start down. The flight engineer said, we're out here quite a ways. I better turn the heat down. At 11.05 and 6 seconds, the crew reviewed the field elevation, the minimum descent altitude, and the final approach fix, and discussed the reason that no time to the missed approach point was published. At 11.06 and 15 seconds, the first officer commented that, I hate the altitude jumping around. And then he commented that the instrument panel was bouncing around. At 11.06.15, the captain said, We have a discrepancy in our VORs. A little, but not much. Fly yours, not mine. At 11.06 and 27 seconds, the captain discussed the last reported ceiling and minimum descent altitude. We should break out. At 11.06.42, the first officer said, It gives you a headache after a while watching this altitude jumping around like that. At 11.07.27, he said, You can feel that wind down here now. A few seconds later, the captain said, You know, according to this dumb sheet, it says 3,400 around hill. Well, that's our minimum altitude. Well, here, round hill is 11.5 DME, the first officer said. The flight engineer then asked where the captain saw that, and the captain replied, and said, well, but when he clears you, that means you can go to your, and then an unidentified voice said, initial approach altitude, and another unidentified voice said, yeah, and the captain said, yeah, initial approach altitude. The flight engineer then said, we're out of 28 for 18, and someone said, one to go. At 1108.14, the flight engineer said, dark in here, and the first officer said, and bumpy too. At 11.08.25, the sound of an altitude alert horn was recorded. The captain said, I had ground contact a minute ago. And the first officer replied, yeah, I did too. At 11.08.29, the first officer said, power on this, expletive. The captain said, yeah, you got a high sink rate. The first officer replied, yeah. An unidentified voice said, we're going uphill. And the flight engineer replied, we're right there. We're on course. Two voices responded, yeah. The captain then said, you ought to see ground outside in a minute. Hang in there, boy. Flight engineer said, we're getting seasick. At 11.08.57, the altitude alert sounded. Then the flight officer said, boy, it was, I wanted to go right down there, man. To which an unidentified voice replied, yeah. Then the first officer said, must have had a heck of a downdraft. At 11.09.14, the radio altimeter warning horn sounded and stopped. The first officer said, boy. At 11.09.20, the captain said, get some power on. The radio altimeter warning horn sounded again and stopped. At 11.09 and 22 seconds, the sound of impact was recorded. At 11.09.54, the approach controller called Flight 514 and said, TWA 514, say your altitude. There was no response. On its approach to Dulles, 
TWA Flight 514 from Indianapolis and Columbus and carrying more than 90 people slammed into the side of Mount Weather, a foothill of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Only a mile and a half away was a secret underground emergency White House installation. The plane's wings cut a swath through 20-inch wide trees like a giant lawnmower. In the aftermath, the NTSB had a large amount of information to sift through. Unfortunately, there were no survivors to interview, but the cockpit voice recorder was quickly recovered. The NTSB moved quickly to find out not just what went wrong, but what could have been done to make sure that it didn't happen again. They came up with 14 things that needed to change. The FAA moved quickly to implement three of them that they had control over, and in no particular order they are, number one, the need for an incident reporting system, which is intended to identify unsafe operating conditions in order that they can be corrected before an accident occurs. Number two, correction to phraseology used in clearing aircraft on non-precision approaches. And number three, the recommendation that all airline passenger aircraft be equipped with ground proximity warning systems. If you haven't listened to episode number 26, go back and give it a listen. We talk at length about one of the main positive outcomes of the accident, the NASA ASRS program, which was recommendation number one, the need for an incident reporting system. And this is something that's still going strong today, and nearly all pilots in the U.S. are familiar with it. The sheer number of accidents and incidents it's prevented is, of course, unquantifiable, but my opinion is that it's one of the single most important resources available to shape how our national airspace system evolves, and I'm not the only one. Our first change, of course, is safety reporting systems. Who here listens to the Flying Life podcast with Dispatcher Mike? Well, my hand is held up, that's for sure. Mike's a dispatcher at Acme Airlines. Yep, the same Acme as Captain Jeff and Captain Dana at APG. Pretty cool. As such, he has a really unique perspective on airline operations that a lot of people don't even know exists. But what he does is really the full-blown support network that makes an airline's operational side actually work. And airline dispatchers are FAA airman certificate holding people too. They really know their stuff. So I was pretty excited when Dispatcher Mike sent me this. Hey, Brandon, it's Dispatcher Mike from the Flying Life Podcast. Just listened to your uh, latest episode about air safety programs. And as a dispatcher for a major U.S. airline here in the United States, we also have an air safety program. We call it DSAP, uh, the Dispatcher Air Safety Program, uh, a lot of like ASAP or anything like that. Basically, it's the same model as the pilots have, but it's for dispatchers. And I'm incredibly glad that the air traffic controllers have the same type of program. And you're right, th- these ASAP programs absolutely positively enhance safety. Now, at Acme, where I work, we are leading the industry in the number of reports. And you would would think that, oh, no, that's a bad thing. You guys, you guys are screwing things up so much. No, it's not that we're screwing it up so much, that the, the safety culture is there, that whenever a mistake or an error is made, or even you don't have to fill out an air safety report, an ASR, a NASA report, an ASAP, or anything like that, when you screwed up, it's not only for when you screw up, you can put something up there. It's any time that you notice that there's an error that is going on or something that is a safety risk. I remember a couple of times I filled out DSAP reports, not because I've hosed something up or anything like that. It's because the actual something that I have saw, something that I experienced was not normal, was a safety concern, so I just wrote it up. And that's what the model of the program is. Now, something that the airlines do is, we I think it's quarterly, they have what's called the Aviation Info Share, or the Aviation Safety Info Share. Now, this is where participating airlines come together and literally air their dirty laundry with each other. It is a two and a half day meeting seminar where in the morning of the first day you have everyone together in one room and there's presentations. And but the the rest of the next half day to the next day, so the next day and a half, you're broken into your subgroups or your your working groups as it is. And so you're broken down into uh, the cabin. So all of the flight attendants get together with their and share their stories and their information and safety concerns that they have seen in their airlines together. And then you break down. So the cabins, the dispatch, the flight ops, the ground ops, and the maintenance personnel. 
all have breakout sections for a day and a half that literally all they do is share stories from their company in order to share information with the other airlines. And it's a beautiful event. It is a great, absolute event. It, it, the purpose is there is to gain safety knowledge and to share the information that your airline has learned with the other personnel that had to do the exact same jobs at your airline. And it it is literally, you, you are, I'm going to say it, you air your dirty laundry. Oops, we did this. Yep. Yes, we did. And this is what we, the steps that we have taken in the future to write our air. We did it. This is how we fixed it within our organization. We're now sharing that information with you. Don't make the same mistake we did. And all of that comes from the ASAP, the NASA ASR reports, is creating a much safer aviation industry that we have. I mean, you look at the number of passengers killed since the Colgan air crash was back in, what, 2009? We're at one there has been one fatality, and that happened this year on a freak accident in Southwest, honestly. But that whole industry is learning already from that incident. So great job sharing about the uh, air safety programs. Here's just a little f- bit of feedback from from the dispatch point of view. Um, keep up the great work on the podcast. Absolutely, positively love it, and uh, have a great one. Mike, thank you so much for sharing that. Very insightful. Quickly, if you're not familiar with him, go over to flyinglife.com, subscribe to his podcast, I'm a subscriber, and you should be too. So what else came out of this crash? The second big change, of course, is phraseology changes. Let's get back to the NTSB report. Testimony of the public hearing indicated that air traffic controllers may vector flights to proceed to various points within the approach area to position the aircraft for the execution of the approach. Aircraft are often vectored off published routes toward points on the approach path, and then are often cleared to descend to altitudes below the minimum published altitude on approach charts. Controllers and pilots have available to them the same information regarding minimum sector altitudes within 25 miles of airports, as well as minimum altitudes for various segments of an instrument approach. However, the controller also has available minimum vectoring altitudes, which he may use to clear aircraft to altitudes in certain areas, even when those altitudes are below the minimum altitudes depicted on the instrument approach charts in the pilot's possession. Pilots have no way of knowing the minimum vectoring altitudes except through experience. Pilots testified that they had become accustomed to this sort of service and frequently did not know exactly where they were in relation to the terrain and obstacles depicted on their charts. The testimony indicated that pilots had become so accustomed to receiving assistance from controllers that unless advised by their controller, they do not know what type of services they are or are not receiving. Witnesses from the FAA testified that this is not necessary for pilots to know what services they are receiving and that the pilot still has ultimate responsibility for maintaining terrain clearance. In their testimony, the FAA referred to the pilot's responsibilities as outlined in Part 91 and 121. Part 91, of course, states, 91.3a, under responsibility and authority of the pilot in command, that the pilot in command of an aircraft is directly responsible for and is the final authority as to the operation of that aircraft. And further, Part 121, which is what covers scheduled air carriers, at the time at least, outlined under 121.533, that the responsibility for operational control in domestic air carriers, paragraph D says, each pilot in command of an aircraft is, during flight time, in command of the aircraft and crew and is responsible for the safety of the passengers, crew members, cargo, and airplane. The FAA Air Traffic Control Manual, and remember, this is at the time, not currently, uh, the FAA Air Traffic Control Manual 7110 at the time, point 8C, it's now the point 65, Uh, which was in effect on December 1st, 1974, prescribed that the air traffic control procedures and phraseology to be used by FAA personnel who provide terminal air traffic control services. Controllers are required to be familiar with the provisions of this handbook, which pertain to their operational responsibility and to exercise their best judgments if they encounter situations not covered by the manual. The manual is offered for sale to the public by the Superintendent of Documents, Government Printing Office, Washington, D.C., but is not routinely disseminated to flight crews. Some portions of the manual are used in air carrier training programs, and portions are used in some FAA publications to indoctrinate pilots regarding the air traffic control system. FAA witnesses testify that pilots do not need to know specifically the contents of the manual, including the application of radar services. Chapter 5 of the manual deals with radar operations. Sections 2 through 6 and Section 9 of this chapter define various aspects of radar operation, including vectoring, radar handoffs, radar separation, radar arrivals, and radar identification. Section 9, Radar Arrivals, paragraph 1360, 
Arrival instructions contains the following guides for controllers regarding an aircraft before it reaches the approach gate. Provided that the aircraft was not conducting a radar approach, quote, issue approach clearance, except when conducting a radar approach. If terrain or traffic does not permit unrestricted descent to the lowest published altitude specified in approach procedure prior to final approach descent, controllers shall, one, defer issuance of approach clearance until there are no restrictions, or two, issue altitude restrictions with approach clearance specifying when or at what point unrestricted descent can be made, end quote. The FAA witnesses testified that Flight 514 was inbound to RML by means of the pilot's own navigation, thereby relieving the controller of responsibility under paragraph 1360 of the manual. The witnesses also testified that if IFR arrivals are routinely handled as non-radar arrivals in a radar environment whenever the pilot's navigating without assistance from air traffic control. The witnesses testified that under these conditions, the pilot must provide his own terrain clearance. The air traffic control system provides only separation from other known IFR traffic. No official definitions were provided for the terms radar arrival and non-radar arrival. The Air Traffic Control Manual states that the FAA provides three kinds of radar service. One, radar separation, when radar spacing of aircraft is accomplished in accordance with established FAA minima. Number two, radar navigational guidance, when vectoring aircraft to provide course guidance. And number three, radar monitoring, defined as radar flight following of an aircraft whose primary navigation is being performed by its pilot to observe and note deviations from its authorized flight path airway, or route. As applied to the monitoring of instrument approaches from the final approach fix to the runway, radar monitoring also includes provisions for advice of the aircraft position relative to approach fixes and advisories whenever the aircraft proceeds outside the prescribed safety zones. A fun side note, at the time, the term approach gate was that point on the final approach course, which is one mile from the approach fix on the side away from the airport or five miles from the landing threshold, whichever is further from the landing threshold. Now let's get into the Airman's Information Manual a little bit. The AIM is designed to be a pilot's operational and information manual for use in the national airspace system. And at the time, it was divided into four basic parts, of which part one is the basic flight manual and ATC procedures for flying in the NAS, and included air traffic control information affecting rules, regulations, and procedures, and then a glossary of aeronautical terms and definitions, designated mountainous areas and emergency procedures, and the document is for sale by the Superintendent of Documents, at least it was at the time, and the Government Printing Office, Washington, D.C. The manual is available at most FAA facilities and air carrier operations offices, and nowadays, of course, you can just get it on the FAA website for free. The material in Part 1 of the manual originates in various parts of the FAA and is offered for publication by the various services. There's no single function within the FAA that controls and issues the technical accuracy of the data included in the manual, at least not at the time. The February 1970 issue of the manual, under the heading Instrument Approach, states that upon receiving an approach clearance, the pilot should begin his descent to the approach altitude as soon as possible. That sentence was deleted in May 1970, however, the notation used to indicate a change was not published on that page. There's evidence to indicate that some pilots were not aware of that change. A review of the 1974 issue of the manual, which was in effect at the time of the accident, which describes a radar approach control, states, Prior to the aircraft reaching the approach fix, when established inbound on the final approach course, radar separation will be maintained and the pilot will be expected to complete the approach utilizing the approach aid designated in the clearance as a primary means of navigation. The manual also stated under the heading Instrument Approach Procedures that instrument approach procedures are designed so as to ensure a safe descent from the en route environment to a point where a safe landing can be made. A pilot adhering to these altitudes, flight paths, headings, and weather minimums depicted on the Instrument Approach Procedure chart is assured of obstruction clearance and runway airport alignment. DWA's flight crew training uh, in their Flight Operations Policy Manual and Flight Operations Handbook prescribed the following procedures applicable to a VOR DME approach. Number one, the landing preliminary checklist will be read 10 to 15 minutes before the estimated time of arrival or when leaving flight level 180. Number two, the captain and the first officer will review the approach plate. The pilot not flying will call out the field elevation, the minimum descent altitude, and the time to the missed approach where applicable. The navigational receivers are to be tuned to the appropriate navigational aids for the approach. In this case, the aids were RML and either Front Royal or Martinsburg VORs. The following instructions regarding the use of the altitude alert system and the radio altimeter during descent were excerpted from the same publication. Number one, set the altitude alert system for each altitude assigned by air traffic control. If cleared for the approach prior to reaching the charted initial approach altitude, set the initial approach altitude into the system until further descent is initiated. When cleared to descend below the initial approach altitude, position the altitude alert control to cancel further warnings. Number two, after the altitude alert system is set for the initial approach altitude, an amber light will come on 1,000 feet prior to reaching that altitude. At this time, the pilot not flying will call 1,000 feet to go.
500 above the initial approach, an altitude beep will sound. The amber light will turn green 250 feet above that altitude. Number three, set the radio altimeter at 100 feet. It'll provide a two second tone when the aircraft is within 500 feet of terrain and the radio altimeter indicator will begin to display the last 500 feet of altitude. When the aircraft is 50 feet above the radio altimeter bug setting, this tone will begin and increase in amplitude until the bug setting is reached. On passing the bug, the tone will shut off abruptly to alert the pilots that minimums have been reached. TWA Flight Operations Training Bulletin 74-8 directed pilots to use the radio altimeter as a go-around proximity warning on all approaches. TWA trained its pilots on the provisions of, among other regulations, CFR 1491.119 and 121.657. Those regulations prohibited any person from operating an aircraft under IFR at an altitude less than 1,000 feet above the highest obstacle within a horizontal distance of 5 miles from the center of the intended course or in designated mountainous areas less than 2,000 feet above the highest obstacle within the same horizontal distance from the center of the intended course. Air carrier pilots are not required to have topographical charts in the cockpit and therefore must rely on low altitude and route charts and instrument approach charts to determine the height above terrain and obstacles. In this accident, the Jeppesen chart depicting the approach showed an obstacle at an elevation of 1,764 feet near the impact point. The highest obstacle shown on the chart was an obstruction marked as 1,930 feet, about 5 nautical miles south of the track of Flight 514. This obstruction was marked with a heavy black arrow. In 1967, the U.S. Air Force questioned the FAA's procedures for instrument approaches with regard to the responsibility for train clearance. FAA responded that they would change the air traffic control handbooks to require the controller to include altitude information when approach clearances were issued. The change made to the manual did not require altitude restrictions on all approach clearances. Correspondence between the U.S. Air Force and the FAA regarding this subject continued intermittently until December 11, 1974, when the FAA advised the U.S. Air Force that a pilot should understand that regardless of whether he is or is not receiving radar navigational guidance, except for a surveillance or PAR approach, and regardless of the pilot's position when cleared for an approach, he is expected to remain at the last assigned altitude or descent not below the minimum in route altitude, transition altitude, or minimum obstruction clearance altitude, and adhere to any remaining altitudes specified on the approach plate while completing the instrument approach. Subsequently, the Air Force made an emergency change, the Air Force Manual 5137, which instructed military pilots that, quote, once approach clearance has been received, maintain last assigned altitude until established on the published final approach course. End quote. The manual previously stated that a pilot under radar control, when cleared for a non-precision approach, could descend to the final approach fixed altitude. Early in 1970, TWA personnel became concerned about the proper interpretations of the AIM and ATC manual regarding what a pilot's action should be when he was cleared for an approach under certain conditions. Their primary concern was with clearances which did not contain positive altitude assignments. On July 1, 1970, TWA wrote to the FAA regarding this matter and characterized the situation as potentially disastrous. They further stated that pilots, radar controllers, and air carrier inspectors must be in total and unqualified agreement as to what the pilot is expected and safely permitted to do after an approach clearance is issued without an altitude. The FAA response stated in part that, quote, because of inquiries by you and others, we're undertaking a study of the problem to determine the clarification that may be required, end quote. On December 21, 1970, the FAA issued a GNOT, or a general notice, for internal distribution that said in part, there appears to be some pilot and controller misunderstandings as to the meaning of the lowest published altitude specified in approach prior to the final approach descent. Therefore, controllers are cautioned to use care when clearing radar vectored aircraft for approach. To guard against the possibility of misinterpretation, controllers shall assure adherence to the requirements of 7110.8 and 7110.9 and whenever traffic or terrain does not permit unrestricted descent to the glide slope interception altitude or the lowest altitude depicted on the profile view of the approach plate for all other types of approaches, or three, the minimum decision altitude, MDA, if no altitude is depicted, these provisions of this GNOT will be incorporated in future changes to Handbook 7110.8 and 7110.9. The GNOT was canceled by the FAA on June 1st, 1971. All right, well, that was a lot of interesting but relatively dry background. But here, this is where I really started perking up, and the part I'm sure you're all really most curious about, right? Air traffic controller training. This far past the accident, it's pretty easy to see that this was a really big part of the puzzle. And as we go through this part, think about how different things are now. Air traffic controller training is conducted in air traffic procedures, operational directives, and equipment familiarization, but no flight training is required of or given to controllers. And we've talked about that before. The Dulles air traffic controllers were divided up into three teams for training purposes. The schedule is made up to provide one full day of training per week for each controller. Two types of training are provided, developmental and proficiency. 
developmental training is conducted to perfect the skills necessary to qualify a controller for a particular operating position. Proficiency training is divided into three areas, refresher, remedial, and supplemental. Refresher training is conducted to review current facility operational procedures. Remedial training is conducted to correct a specific operational deficiency. And supplemental training is conducted to train controllers in new revised procedures, regulations, equipment, etc. Supplemental training is intended to assure that each controller remains proficient in his assigned operating positions. Proficiency training is conducted through a combination of classroom training, briefings, and self-study. The self-study is facilitated by use of the facility mandatory read and initial binder. Fun side note, we still use read and initial binders today. This book contains material required for proficiency training, and each item included in the book has an attached initial sheet. The controller initials this sheet to indicate he has read, understands, and will comply with the contents of the book. The controller who handled Flight 514 at the time of the accident was in a group that, according to witnesses, received training on the VOR DMA approach to runway 12 on July 17, 1974. Nineteen controllers, including this controller, assigned to the facility, state that they had not received formal training on the subject. However, the controller who cleared Flight 514 for the approach said that he understood the approach and he knew how to use it. He did not refer to the approach chart while he was handling Flight 514, nor was he required to. He stated that he was familiar with the terrain west of Dulles by virtue of his 12 years experience at Dulles. Controllers were trained to provide additional services, as specified in paragraph 1540 of the 7110.8, to aircraft when they could fit the service into the performance of higher priority duties and on the basis of the following. A. Provision of the service is not mandatory because many factors such as limitations of radar, volume of traffic, communications, frequency, congestion, and your workload could prevent you from providing it. B. You have complete discretion for determining if you are able to provide or continue to provide a service in a particular case. And C. Your decision not to provide or continue to provide a service in a particular case is not subject to question by the pilot and need not be made known to him. Among the additional services that a controller could offer to a flight pursuant to 7110.8 were safety advisories, and altitude deviation information. The controller in this case stated that he saw the data block from Flight 514 show an indicated altitude of 2,000 feet, and he attempted to contact the flight at 11.09 and 54 seconds. Prior to that time, the controller stated the data was in a precipitation return and was, quote, difficult to see, end quote. And here's where stuff gets pretty real. Handling of other flights at Dulles. The safety board reviewed the handling of other arriving IFR flights at Dulles on December 1st, 1974, about half an hour before the accident, an air carrier flight approached Dulles from the northwest and was cleared for a VOR DME approach to runway 12. The pilot of that flight said that because he was a considerable distance from the airport and was not given an altitude restriction to use before arriving on a published approach segment, he requested information regarding the minimum vectoring altitude at the flight's position. The controller gave the pilot the MVA and offered the flight a surveillance radar approach. The captain accepted the surveillance approach and landed without further incident. About six hours after TWA's 514 accident, a second air carrier aircraft approached Dulles from the southwest and, at a point about 21 miles from Dulles, had asked the controller for the flight's position relative to the Round Hill intersection. The controller replied that he did not have Round Hill depicted on his radar. The captain later testified that he was familiar with the terrain around Dulles and did not descend until he was on an inbound heading to runway 12 and inside 17.6 miles, as indicated on his DME indicator. Wow. Okay, so after all that, what actually changed about how controllers issue approach clearances? Well, just a couple of words, really, but they make all the difference, and they carry through to this day. Since then, and up until now, we use the phraseology, quote, maintain, and then issue a specific altitude, until established, on a published segment of the approach, and then state, you're cleared for whatever approach. Our last big change that came out of this accident was ground proximity warning systems. Based on the NTSB recommendation, the FAA directed that all air carrier aircraft be equipped with a ground proximity warning system by December of 1975. And so it was. Captain Jan Minkler of American Airlines was flying his 727 toward Dulles Airport and was told to begin his approach again without being told how low to go. But Minkler challenged the controller. I hesitated to descend because of the timing of the approach clearance and because of our distance out. In this case, we got handed off and cleared for an approach. We weren't psychologically prepared to receive that clearance that soon or that far from the airport. It happens once in a blue moon. some other really interesting stuff about this flight too. 
And first off, this was a terrible day with respect to aviation safety. There was another notable crash on the same day, and it was another 727, but this one was Northwest Flight 6231. The aircraft departed in a wintry weather mix without the pitot heat turned on, and the aircraft stalled and crashed. The flight was a charter pickup to the Baltimore Colts in Buffalo after the original aircraft that was supposed to transport the team was grounded by a snowstorm in Detroit. Only the crew was aboard. But back to TWA Flight 514, I found an article from the Washington Post by Jane Seabury dated November 3rd, 1977, and it's interesting because it's about the damages awarded to, or, or better yet, not awarded to the families of the cockpit crew. When an airliner crashes, obviously the lawsuits start flying immediately. Families are entitled to certain compensation based on different conventions, but typically victims' families will sue either individually as a group, and while the airlines are probably the most obvious target, sometimes the lawyers will go after the FAA too, or individual equipment manufacturers, etc. But in the case of TWA 514, Due to the way things were at the time, the widows and children of the cockpit crew were denied in a big way. So let's check out the article. A federal judge has refused to award damages to the widows of the pilot and co-pilot of a TWA flight that crashed into the Blue Ridge Mountains three years ago, killing all aboard, on the grounds that their husbands were negligent in the crash. U.S. District Court Judge Albert V. Bryan Jr. said in an opinion released yesterday that the FAA air traffic controllers did the best they could to prevent the crash. Among other things, the judge said, the pilots ignored several mechanical warnings alerting them that they were less than 500 feet above the ground as they approached the fog-shrouded mountainside. Brian's decision, signed late Tuesday, came in the last of 50 suits filed against TWA or the FAA as a result of the December 1, 1974 crash. Earlier, seven juries had awarded more than a million in damages to relatives of the passengers on the flight, and in these cases, the FAA agreed to pay part of the awards, tacitly sharing with TWA responsibility for the crash. Also, Relatives of a flight engineer, another member of the flight crew, uh, Brian found negligent received an out-of-court settlement in his case last April. Philip Silverman, one of the three attorneys appointed by Judge Brian to handle preliminary matters for the claimants in all trials, said he was not surprised by Brian's decision because in the settlements, TWA took the greater responsibility for the crash by agreeing to pay about 70% of the jury award, leaving the federal government to pay about 30% on the behalf of the FAA. The exact split of responsibility between TWA and FAA, Silverman said, is not publicly known because the settlement papers have been sealed. Judge Farrell, attorney for Marlene Brock, the widow of the pilot Richard Brock, and Donna Kreshik, widow of co-pilot Leonard Kreshik, said Brian's ruling is, quote, sort of a strange decision. He would not elaborate. Farrell said yesterday he had not yet seen the opinion. The two women are working in Los Angeles, Farrell said, trying to make a living for their children. In the first judicial opinion, centered in any of the cases, others were resolved either by a jury or an out-of-court settlement, Brian said it was the duty of the traffic controllers to see that the airplane did not collide with any other aircraft, but it was up to the flight crew to ensure that the plane did not hit the ground, Brian said. Brian also found that pilot Brock should have kept the plane at a proper altitude, and it was not the air traffic controller's responsibility. Quote, the crew of TWA 514 was required to know the areas of the U.S. designated as mountainous, Brian said. A full minute prior to the impact, the altitude alert horn sounded in the cockpit, indicating the aircraft was 500 feet above terrain, Brian said. The horn sounded two more times within a minute of the crash. Apparently, it was ignored by the entire crew, Brian said. Nor did any member of the crew, as required by TWA training procedures, verbally respond to the sounds. Brian said that if crew members had not been negligent, they would have had a last chance to save the plane. Of the 50 cases filed on behalf of 56 victims, 41 were settled privately out of court. The jury awards range from $36,000 to $546,488.84, the latter figure granted a year ago in the family of a Chapel Hill, North Carolina woman. The jury awarded $48,714.81 to her husband, $200,000 to her 12-year-old daughter, and $250,000 to her 7-year-old son. The statute of limitations prohibited the filing of suits growing out of the crash after December 2, 1976. The TWA jetliner was on its inaugural flight from Indianapolis to Washington National, with one stop at Columbus, Ohio, the judge's opinion noted, but fierce winds and heavy rains diverted it to Dulles. The flight crew and air traffic controller apparently misunderstood each other during the plane's descent to Dulles, Brian said. At 11.09, the plane sheared off treetops, struck a rocky outcrop, broke up and caught fire, scattering charred bodies and parts of bodies over an area about the size of two football fields. Quote, suffice it to say that this court finds no lack of ordinary care or violation of any duty owed the aircraft on part of the air traffic controller after he actually saw the peril of the aircraft. End quote. Further quoting, The last clear chance to avoid this accident was had by the crew, not the controller. If the crew had only heeded one of the many warnings available to them, and which they should have heeded right up until the 1109 alert warning, the crash could have been avoided. End quote. <laughs> 
Now, I don't know if the widows ever ended up receiving any compensation at all, but after the mega changes following the accident and the fact that it was such a systemic issue, I hope that, I don't know, maybe at least some of the kids got something. But if anybody out there has information on this, please contact me and let me know. A really good book was written, and it's called The Sound of Impact by Adam Shaw. There's a link in the show notes to go buy it. There were some notable passengers aboard the flight, too. Uh, one was General Roscoe, also known as Rock Cartwright, one of the Army's first black generals, and his wife Gloria were aboard. In 1973, General Rock Cartwright had been a keynote speaker at a gathering of African-American officers. He challenged those in attendance to continue to get to know each other, help mentor junior officers, and help each other whenever possible. At a later meeting, the assembled group could not agree on a permanent name. In the interest of having an identity, they called themselves the No Name Club. During the planning for the group's first New Year's Eve party, word was received that Cartwright and his wife were both killed in TWA 514. Before the meeting adjourned, it was agreed that the organization should be named after the general. This name, The Rocks, was voted upon, and it was unanimously agreed, plus that a scholarship fund be established within the group to be named the Roscoe C. Cartwright Scholarship Fund in honor of his mentorship. Also aboard the flight was James Applewhite, a legislative assistant to Representative Andrew Young of Georgia and Applewhite's wife and their three-year-old son. The area where the aircraft crashed to brought national attention to what's called the Mount Weather Emergency Operations Center. And according to Wikipedia, the Mount Weather Emergency Operations Center is a civilian command facility in Virginia that's used as the center of operations for the Federal uh, Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and also known as the High Point Special Facility. Uh, its preferred designation since 1991 is SF. HPSF is what that stands for. Uh, the facility is a major relocation site for the highest level of civilian and military officials in case of a national disaster, playing a major role in continuity of government. Mount Weather is the location of a control station for the FEMA National uh, Radio System, the FNARS, a high-frequency radio system connecting most federal public safety agencies and U.S. military with most of the states. It allows the president to access the emergency alert system as well. The site was brought into the public eye, uh, first off by the Washington Post, when the government facility was mentioned while reporting on the December 1st, 1974 crash into Mount Weather of TWA Flight 514. According to a letter of the editor of the Washington Post, after the September 11th attacks, most of the congressional leadership was actually evacuated to Mount Weather by helicopter. Between 1979 and 81, the National Gallery of Art developed a program to transport valuable paintings in its collection to Mount Weather via helicopter. The success of the relocation would depend on how far in advance the warning of an attack was received. There's a fascinating documentary, by the way, called Diverted, and it covers this event very, very well. Definitely worth watching. So, after all the research, the heated testimony, the crash scene cleanup, and a whole lot of finger pointing, on December 26, 1975, the NTSB issued its probable cause. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the accident was the crew's decision to descend to 1,800 feet before the aircraft had reached the approach segment where that minimum altitude applied. The crew's decision to descend was a result of inadequacies and lack of clarity in the air traffic control procedures, which led to a misunderstanding on the part of the pilots and on the controllers regarding each other's responsibilities during operations in terminal areas under instrument meteorological conditions. Nevertheless, the examination of the plan view of the approach chart should have disclosed to the captain that a minimum altitude of 1,800 was not a safe altitude. Contributing factors were number one, the failure of the FAA to take timely action to resolve the confusion and misinterpretation of air traffic terminology, although the agency had been aware of the problem for several years. Number two, the issuance of the approach clearance when the flight was 44 miles from the airport on an unpublished route without clearly defined minimum altitudes. And number three, inadequate depiction of the altitude restrictions on the profile view of the approach chart for the VOR DME approach to runway 12 at Dulles International. The recommendations were... As the result of the accident, the NTSB submitted 14 recommendations to the Administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration. Subsequent to the accident, the FAA has taken several actions in an effort to prevent recurrence of this type of accident. The FAA has directed that all air carrier aircraft be equipped with a ground proximity warning system by December 1975. The FAA has revised the provisions of Part 91 with regard to pilot responsibilities and actions after receiving a clearance for a non-precision approach. The FAA has established an incident reporting system, which is intended to identify unsafe operating conditions in order that they can be corrected before an accident occurs. The FAA has changed its air traffic control procedures to provide for the issuance of altitude restrictions during non-precision instrument approaches. The FAA is installing a modification to the ARTS-3 system that will alert air traffic controllers when aircraft deviate from predetermined altitudes while operating in the terminal area. The probable cause statement is signed by the National Transportation Safety Board Chairman John Reed. Chairman Reed and the members, Thayer and Burgess, concurred in the adoption of this report. Members McAdams and Haley 
dissented. If you want to learn more about this crash, it's well covered. Surprisingly, a lot of people don't actually know much about it, but so many changes came out of it that I think it's essential knowledge. In addition to what I've covered, make sure to use the links in this episode's show notes to learn more. If you want to make some comments on what you heard today or any other episode, head over to podcastingonaplane.com. The podcast is listener supported. If you want to become a supporter, click on the support tab. Some credit for the content in this show goes to the NTSP, The Washington Post, Ember Riddle Library Online, Check6.com, the Wikipedia, and ABC News. And a very special thank you goes to dispatcher Mike Carrolls from the Flying and Life podcast for his feedback contribution to this episode. And as usual, the music you heard in this episode is produced by Daniel Zombo. The frequency change is approved for now, and a report back on this frequency for the next episode. Good day! Casting on a Plane podcast is presented for entertainment purposes only. My comments and those of my guests, the website's content, and any of the social media, etc., are not part of my official responsibility as a controller or an FAA employee. The views and opinions you hear on the podcast are mine and those of my guests, and not necessarily that of the FAA. There is no nexus between podcasting on a plane and the FAA. Also, while I am a CFI, I'm not your CFI. Nor am I your mechanic, your doctor, your shrink, or your spouse. This podcast is presented for entertainment, camaraderie, and fun, but is in no way, shape, or form professional advice. It's not legal counsel, and it's definitely not flight instruction. If you are in need of professional advice, get some from somewhere more appropriate than a podcast, no matter how good this one may be. Mm-hmm.